The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. In honor of the Avengers, I think we should call this week's Crashing Glass a uh, chick of steel. How does that sound, Jill? That sounds perfect. <laughs> Love it. Of course, uh, our guest today is a little bit different. Everybody thinks of their mom as a superhero, but my mom worked in a foundry, uh, hence why she is the chick of steel. And so we're going to talk to her a little bit about what that was like. My mom worked in uh, the foundry that was actually founded by her father and his brothers for uh, 20 years and uh, was the quality assurance manager, so all the other mothers wore dresses and, you know, whatever. Day to day. It's, old it's old Avon door to door. Yes, Avon. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my mom uh, wore steel-toed boots and pearl snap shirts and a hard hat. So we're going to talk to her about what that was like and, uh, and just sort of get a feel for women in manufacturing, I guess would be a really good way to talk about it. So uh, this, is, uh, this is my mother, Fran Hurley. Hi, Fran. Hi, Holly. Hi, Jill. Hi. So, Mom, tell us a little bit about sort of the genesis of Smith Steel, the history, sort of what its place was in the steel industry in America. All right. My dad and uh, his three brothers started Smith Steel Casting Company in about 1950, which was uh, right after World War II, but there was a lot of need in the area in the uh, oil field industry and the train industry and a lot of different industries for a casting company and uh, our specialty we actually my dad used to say that we got the crumbs of the industry but oh those crumbs were sweet and many uh, steel industries do th hundreds of thousands of the same part but we did the onesies and twosies, the items that people needed, but they didn't need a whole lot of them. And um, they would give us their patterns and their specifications, and we would make those specialty parts for them. And it was really a, it, it was a great thing. It filled a need, and uh, my dad was really good at it. So you guys are kind of the craftsmen of the steel industry, if you will. Oh, well, that sounds great. Daddy would be thrilled to hear you put it that way. <laughs> Fran, we're so glad to have you today. And I just want for, for the like listeners maybe who did not grow up with a mom who worked in a foundry, <laughs> I just want to, if you would just like even go back to basics um, and explain maybe like what the day-to-day -day work was a foundry is a factory for cast that for casting metal that's right it produces yes. metal castings and so like you know in melting it into the liquid pouring the liquid into a mold and and so on and so when you said you did the small pieces like what kind of things did you make well we didn't do small pieces we did the low quantity pieces oh low quantity okay yes our pieces ranged anywhere from um a few pounds to thousands of pounds our capability of melting and pouring, um, we had a furnace that would put out typically uh, 7,000 pound heats. Uh, we took scrap metal, scrap steel, melted it down, refined it, alloyed it according to specifications, and by that we put in chrome, nickel, moly, according, uh, molybdenum, according to the needs of the steel. We poured it into sand cast molds. Some of the molds were, were loose sand that was just temporarily made a little firmer and then hammered with a large hammer uh, into a mold, into a casing. And we made the, if, if the part that you were making had an opening, had an empty area, we made the cores and uh, that went into the molds and then poured the molten metal in and of course steel shrinks and as it uh, solidifies, as it cools and solidifies, it has to have an extra amount of metal to feed the part to make the part solid uh -huh. and the real trick if you will, the real craftsmanship in the industry is knowing where and how to put these feeders 
so that the part is as solid as possible. Um, we also, besides the loose molds, the loose sand molds, there was a binder material that we could make, put with the sand that would make it firm and hard and would stand alone. So there were, you know, several different things. We utilized all of those. There's a lot of science in making steel. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, see, I love that one of my lifelong things is just understanding more, you know, about, well, just about the world. I, I do like science specifically, too, but I, and so I like to hear, sort of, like, learn a little bit, because I wouldn't have been able to tell you what exactly Foundry does. <laughs> I don't know if I had that stored the right way, but now I do, so thank you for explaining the process. You are welcome, and it is so true. I mean, unless that you have some opportunity or need or exposure, it's not something you typically run across in life. Right. Now, I know there was a time in Smith Steel's history where you would see sort of a list of the biggest foundries in, in the country, and sometimes Smith Steel would make the list. What were some of the other players out there? I mean, obviously, you guys were small in comparison to, say, I, I don't know, you know, U.S. Steel. Who were, who were some of the big people that were out there? Um, <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Uh, it's been a while, and I'm not remembering. I to to actually just run that by you would is difficult in our little playing field area. Tesco was a foundry that was much larger than us, but we competed against. Quality Steel was another one that we compete against. But all of those, uh, there was a foundry out of Amit, Louisiana. All of those were sort of regional companies that uh, that made the same type product that we did. Um, as I said, a lot of the other foundries made hundreds of thousands of parts and um, sort of a little bit different styling of, of parts, so it's yeah. hard to say. So then I know, uh, I, I, you know, Joe was talking about the day-to-day -day of what a foundry does. I'd like to sort of revisit that and sort of talk about your day-to-day, -day, getting up in the morning and all that sort of stuff. What, what was your position like as a quality assurance manager? Well, as a quality assurance manager, I had the privilege of moving throughout the plant, observing our processing, um, looking for, if I had a, a part, um, a steel casting uh, inherently, as it's cooling down and shrinking, sometimes the way the part is made creates its own crack. And you have to look for that. And uh, part of my job was to try to solve those problems, figure out when it occurred, how to keep it from occurring. But I would, um, looking at my day to day, I would come in, look at what we were pouring for the day, both the types of items and the type of steel that we would be making. We did have two steel making processes. One of them was called an arc furnace, which was a, the furnace that would make the 7,000 pound heats. We had large electrodes that carried a really high voltage um, electricity through them that would jump from the electrodes through the metal and that's the way we would melt it. Then we also had what was called an induction furnace and our induction furnace was about a 2,000, 2000 pound furnace and uh, it, it worked on a system of a magnetic field and heated up the steel. Anyway, I would look to see which types of um, which types of metal we were going to be pouring for the day. Uh, we had, they were called like 8630, that uh, determined how much uh, chromium, nickel, molybdenum, manganese, uh, carbon content went into the steel. Uh, we had M35, which, is, which was a manganese molybdenum blend. Uh, and each of these had its own characteristic, but I would see what we were pouring for the day. It was um, my job to also test the metal to uh, prove that it had those different alloys in it. And um, the machine that we used to do that was called a spectrometer, and it worked on the basis of a light ray and uh, dividing it into its different um, um, separating it kind of like a prism into its different uh, alloys. 
and I had to make sure that all of that came out right, that things were weighed up properly, that the the metal is heated in the uh, in the big furnaces, then it's poured in ladles. The ladles are carried down to the pouring floor where the metal actually goes from the ladle into the molds. And I had to be sure that the ladles were warmed up properly. And you know, it was somebody else's job to do these specific things, but it was my job to observe that our processing was basically going correctly. Then after the product was made and the, um, the risers, which were those feeding, um, those little feeding bats that, bats that were on the side or the top of the castings that made them solid, the risers would be cut off with a metal cutting torch and then the castings would be placed in a furnace and they had to be tempered, they had to be heat treated, you would bring them up to a certain heat and how high you brought it up, how you cooled it down, all of these things um, it, um, influenced the characteristics of the steel. And then it was my job to, if we had a casting that we knew was prone to cracking, I would go through and uh, see that the castings were magnafluxed and magnafluxing was here again using a, um, a current, a magnetic field to check for cracks. And um, then we also did an ultrasound and ultrasound was putting... Like putting, what you do to look at babies? Yes, 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 wow. precisely. Ultrasound would, there would be a sound that would go through a casting. Now, there were two different ways to handle it. You could go straight through the casting to see if there was an interruption. But typically, we used what was called the bounce back method, where it would go down, uh, it would go through the metal to the far wall, and then bounce back uh, uh, to the, the instrument that we used to put the sound through. And if it went down and bounced back through, hey, the, the casting was solid. If it went down and there were breaks in the return of the sound, you knew that there was something in there. And you didn't always, it was really tricky to try to figure out just how deep it was in the casting and to go in and get it. But anyway, and then we also utilized x-rays. Uh, we would x-ray a casting to be sure that it was solid. So. All of these different things went into my daily, depending upon what we were pouring, what the customer specifications were, all of those went into my, um, into my daily routine. So that's pretty technical. Two, two questions for you. The first one is, what kind of degree did you have for this and how did you learn how to do this, this stuff, how to, how to look at this stuff, how to, how to know what alloys go in and how much of each one, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the <laughs> my background was actually in mathematics, and I have both a master's and an undergraduate degree, bachelor of science degree in mathematics. The training that I got originally, how I got interested in all this, when I was in the ninth grade of high school, I did a science fair project uh, at our local, our high school science fair and then went on to the uh, regional science fair and then went on uh, at that point in time junior high kids didn't go on to state now they do but anyway I only uh, I went to the regionals and took first place but my project was in metallurgy and had to do with the the different types of steel the pouring and the heat treat of steel and my father it was one of my most wonderful, wonderful remembrances with my dad because he he and I to test the the steel castings you you pour a little testing block, you saw a part of it off, you have it machined down and you pull test it. And I learned to do all of those things. I learned what difference the different kinds of alloys made what difference they made in the strength of the steel, in the, in the flexibility is not a really accurate term, but in the, um, in the ability of the steel to give before it broke. And 
you know, my dad and I, he taught me all of those things for this high school metallurgy project. And it was invaluable information in, what, probably eight years, ten years later, when I came back, uh, when my dad's brothers wanted to sell out of the business, and daddy had three daughters, and he really needed the husbands too, but he wouldn't, he didn't want any husbands without the daughters, so we all were working <laughs> together, if you can imagine. I love that, though, just that, that your dad took that stance. Well, it was really, you know, it goes back to the times and the fact that it was a family-owned business. It was what we called a mom-and-pop shop, which is what our country was built on, was mom-and-pop shops. Those little, those families who went into, you know, like the grocery store guys and the, you know, a family took an area and they developed a business and they passed it from father to son and daughter. And as I said, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, sometimes daughters would go into the businesses, they rarely took the lead. It was a male-oriented society in that respect, business was. But, of course, as, you know, I was fortunate enough to be, be in the time when women began moving into more responsible positions. And although, in a way, we had always done it sort of quietly in the background, we moved into being able to take the forefront. But I was definitely um, a bit of an anomaly in the foundry business to be a woman outside taking a leadership role. And, um, and it was a fun thing. It was a fun thing. But I'm going to tell you something. I learned what hard physical labor was about. And I'm, it, 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 I'm really excited to be able to make a living now without having to do <laughs> hard physical labor. But it certainly gave me a lot of respect for the people who do that. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, Fran, you know, speaking of the, ul the ultrasound and using the sound waves to look inside the the steel, which is so wild to think that, meanwhile, I think you were using ultrasound waves maybe to <laughs> look, in at, look in at Holly. <laughs> um, so you were having this job, quality assurance, in the foundry, going to work every day, and meanwhile you were having you uh, raising two girls, or is there yes. maybe the same figure? So how did you, how did you balance that day to day? How did you balance motherhood and this, this job, this physical physically demanding job. Well, I have to tell you, Jill, a part of this goes back to the mom and pop shop things because while my sisters and my brother-in-laws and my dad were all at the foundry working, my mom would pick up the kids after school oh. and take care of them till we got off from work. So it was a family thing. Yeah, so the grant your mom, so the grandmother was was filling in and, and, and being and filling in for you so that you could participate in the family business. That's it. That's it. She had a very integral part in the success of the business in that way. Yeah. That's wild. So Holly, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. At certain points I think my grandmother got really exasperated and was like, Listen, I'm not I'm not doing this anymore. Your kid is there were, there was inevitably mom remembers it happening with me and with my with her younger sister's youngest kid where my grandmother just said, I can't do this, your kids are too wild, they <laughs> they are too willful, they are not helping me, I cannot handle this and uh, but eventually she still took care of all of us, I think all the way through but I think a part of that mom I would love to hear you speak to that you know there's a lot of talk today about balance and about women trying to find balance and I remember you telling me once you know they told us we can have it all but you can't like I know there were a lot of things you felt like you missed that's exactly right there were so many times that we actually in the foundry when times were good we worked six days a week at least three weeks out of the month and so that meant there was only one Saturday a month that I could go with my daughters to gymnastics meets or to uh, softball games or to um, whatever, whatever cheerleading, whatever they were doing. I had to, um, you know, I, 
I only had a limited amount of time that I could participate, which meant that my children oftentimes rode with other parents, other mothers who didn't work, to uh, gymnastics practices or gymnastics meets and they went like to Dallas and Corpus Christi and several places and even though I was a part of the family, the ownership of the foundry, it was very difficult for me to walk away from my job and leave it to go take care of my children. So I think there were a lot of things that, uh, there were a lot of times that I missed and a lot of support that my children missed because I was a working mom with tremendous responsibility. Now, Mom, I know you have you actually have a limited amount of time here, so two questions. Since Jill mentioned um, having having the ultrasound, I know you had kind of a weird experience chemically while you were dealing with some steel once while you were pregnant with me. Yes. <laughs> When I was, when I first went to work for Smith Steel, I was uh, four months pregnant with Holly. Okay. And uh, they decided because I had had chemistry and some chemical background and the metallurgical background that I should work in the lab. Now, when I first started, we tested the content of the um, steel using uh, in, in a chemical lab where we mixed up different um, chemicals to see the reactions and uh, precipitation and weight and all of this sort of stuff. So <laughs> when I went to the doctor and the smells, the smells in a chemical laboratory are often very strong. And when I went to my OBGYN and said, you know, is this dangerous? Do I need to be worried about the health of my baby? with the, you know, working around the chemicals and all these different smells and everything. And bless his little heart, he thought for a little while, and he looked at me and he said, Fran, you'll be fine as long as you don't spill the acid on you. <laughs> I said, I think I can handle this. I wear a protective apron for that, so I should be okay. So uh, anyway, that addresses those that. Were the, addresses those were the good old days where not every single thing in your life was what people started to feel where it was going to affect their pregnancy in some negative way. <laughs> I mean, now you can't even eat salami. <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. it has swung so far, you know, just you can't even eat, like, soft cheeses and lunch meat. I mean, people are so hyper, you know, there's just so much sort of hyper activity around that that it's kind of nice to hear some good just some sound, reasonable advice from your <laughs> from your old 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 OBGYN. That's cute. Well, and I guess I know Jill, you were really interested in this, but you know, Mom, you spoke about the difference in being a woman in a leadership position in a foundry outside, and obviously that's something we talk about a lot here. Is that you know we feel like there have been a lot of gains, and the women who have sort of not not consider themselves to have limits have moved a lot further but at the same time there is still a very different perception in the workplace um, and I wanted, I wanted you to talk a little bit about being in the leadership position in a foundry and what that was like. Well it was certainly very uh, challenging uh, in our particular uh, foundry and it, and it really does sort of meld into the whole picture of things. We, and I, I, we actually were about, um, we had about 30% blacks, 30% Mexicans, and 30% uh, Caucasian people working in our foundry. And you have to understand that all of us come to uh, wherever we work in life with the, um, with the culture that is brought in from our, uh, the area that we're brought up in and what we've been exposed to and certainly you you really have to consider where the people that you're working with came from in order to best work with them and um, you know it was it a matriarchal society was it a patriarchal society how do they respond to women in leadership and during those 21 years, I certainly faced a lot of, well, no woman's going to tell me what to do. And I was sensitive to that. Now, I was an owner of the company, but I can guarantee you that if somebody didn't do what I told them to do, and I went to HR and said, this person needs to be fired, 
I mean, I didn't feel I had the privilege to fire them on the spot for certain things. I, um, I went through my own processing as to how important was that, and I typically was very careful about how I approached that. I, I tended to say, please do this, rather than, you better, by golly, get this done for me now. And um, it, it varied depending on the circumstance and the situation, but I definitely did not feel free to uh, take the same aggressive aggressiveness that a male counterpoint part in my position might have. But now, you know, we're all kind of careful with each other and you all weigh out um, how valuable is this guy. And yeah, there's a little insubordination there, but is it enough to uh, be worse than the um, benefits that he brings to the table? So you're always weighing that sort of thing out. But as a woman out in the foundry, I did find that I had to be more sensitive to the fact that I was working predominantly, well, completely outside in the foundry itself. I was the only woman out there. Oh, and I could tell you some funny stories about things that the guys were used to doing and they had to alter what they did and how they did it because I might be walking up at any time. But uh, anyway, uh, that, it was... That is amazing. Yeah, Pete, I'm sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. No, I just, I think that, Holly, that I'm glad you brought that side of it up because it is like you sort of as we intro having your mom on as our guest today that she was the you know quality assurance manager in a foundry from uh in the man's kind of in a man's world right in the 70s 80s 90s and you're right the men had to make some minor adjustments <laughs> and you had to probably keep your eyes open all the time just so that you were prepared with that you were ready for to react in a way that you thought, you know, with the sensitivity that you may need. Exactly. Exactly. And here again, you know, the culture's added in too. And the, as is still, I think, to some degree the same, in our 30% Mexican culture, they spoke a different language. Right. And I went through trying to, you know, learn their language, not you know, um, it, because it was a communication thing. I wanted them to be able to understand what I was saying to them because, you know, reaction time, 3,000 degree metal is not real forgiving. So <laughs> if there's going to be something go wrong, you want to be able to communicate with the people you work with and you want them to be able to communicate with you that there's a problem. And so it's it, it, it all goes back to communication. And when you're trying to explain a processing to someone. You know, there when you have a language barrier, it, it makes it a little more difficult. Now, hand signals are really wonderful in a lot of cases, and uh, so we did use a lot of that too. But um, anyway, that, that played in, that was another little extra play into things that, that I got to go through that was new, was new. Um, the, the blending of these cultures was, in our area, uh, quite a new thing. And I think throughout our country, uh, we were going through quite a changing process. Um, in some of the bigger cities, port cities especially, they had been used to people coming in from different countries, etc. But in, in the U.S. as a whole, uh, having the influx influx of people from other countries was sort of new to us, and we were going through a really wonderful but challenging uh, process. I often think that's really difficult to to explain. You know, uh, Jill, I know you live you live outside of Boston, and I mean, you know, in in the Massachusetts area. And when I went when I moved to New York, I remember trying to explain to people uh, sort of what those of us who were children, because you know me and the Longorias and a lot of the kids who were raised by people in the foundry, were just used to having people of all colors, shades, creeds, languages around raising you essentially at That's all times. Too. Because if I was running barefoot through the foundry and mom wasn't around, you know, somebody else's dad is going to have to pick me up and make sure I don't get into trouble. Because right. it was a free-flowing environment for us kids. We were always around. We were in and out of the foundry because everybody worked there 
longer hours than a lot of other jobs, I think, in our town. And so there really wasn't any place for us to be sometimes. And, um, and I think it's interesting. I remember going to New York and people really not understanding that, that where I grew up, we were just going through that where, where it was for me and my friends, we were used to being raised by people of all cultures and creeds, but in my hometown, that's still not, not particularly normal which I think is something people don't know about the rest of the country. You know, the people, where whatever area you're in, you sort of take for granted that whatever's going on in the rest of the country is just like the area you're in. That's right. And probably that applies internationally as well, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, the people sort of assume that our paradigm is, is the culture that we're raised in, right? So, yeah, it takes, I think, it takes more effort and, and more thinking to put yourself outside of that. And that's what I guess Fran's telling us, that she had to do that because of the, the 30, 30, 30 percent of the three different cultures, that you had to do that every day. Yes, yes. And something that just occurred to me, Jill, that I do want to comment on, um, my older sister, going back to sort of our, our theme for, um, for today, my older sister was the first woman president of the Texas chapter of the American Foundry Society. Wow. And uh, that was the sort of positioning that we had in the industry. We, uh, having women in the foundry and taking leadership management roles in the family was very, uh, in the foundry, was very uh, different and uh, sort of a new thing. And she was one of the groundbreakers in a lot of uh, ways also. In our business, my dad was the kingpin. He was the president, the chairman of the board. My older sister was the secretary treasurer of the board, and also she was the purchasing agent, personnel director of the foundry. My baby sister was in charge of in-house sales. She was the vice president of that. I was the vice president of quality. Two of the husbands were uh, salesmen, each having different territories. One in the Fort Worth, Dallas, uh, general uh, out to West Texas, I think, area. Um, one down in the Houston area, Louisiana, sometimes Arkansas. And then the uh, other husband who um, uh, ended up being an ex-husband, uh, but was. stayed with the company after that because oh. his position was too important to replace. <laughs> we we let him go when when they divorced. We kept him too, and it was a wonderful, wonderful thing for everybody. It was, oh, good! It was it was, it was really great. Uh, they remained friends, and that was really, really made it nice on the entire family. And as they each married someone else, we just adopted them and made yeah. them more family. So the more was, the more the merrier, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice. It's nice to hear those kind of happy endings about because not all marriages work out, right? That's exactly correct. You yeah. you know you just as time moves along, we all change, and sometimes we change together, and sometimes we change differently, and that doesn't make anybody bad. It just makes it uh, no longer workable. Right. So, anyway. Holly, we should have Fran on when we do like a, ma a marriage, a show about marriage and keeping it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I will, I'll keep my ears plugged for about half of what makes my parents work. Right. <laughs> Nobody needs to hear that stuff. I mean, lots of people do, just not from your own parents. Oh. <laughs> it's really the best way to talk about it. But anyway, so I'm, I'm glad that we had you on, Mom. Is there anything that you want to leave us with? Really, not that, not that I can think of. I, I have seen a lot of changes in business and the approach of women in business. Some of it is good. Some of it is not so good. Uh, as we have covered, to be great in every area is, it is not exactly um, feasible. There are only 24 hours in a day, and... You just uh, pack it with the things that are important to you. And you. I would say to each and every woman, uh, think about what is really important to you. And as you make your decisions going through life, uh, what you put your time in, it shapes and molds your life and is what your life ends up being all about. 
So weigh that out, and if you uh, are a mother and a working woman and a wife, decide where your balance is on those things lay, and uh, make make sort of a planned, educated decision on it. Don't just let life happen to you. So I guess that would be my parting thought. Wow, and and that's profound. I mean, that was excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so this is uh, Crashing Glass, Chick of Steel. Have a great week, guys, and don't forget, go to BaseNetTV.com and donate money. Not for us, for the Jimmy Fun Scooper Bowl. 20% of everything that's donated to BaseNet this month and next month, actually, goes to the Scooper Bowl, and Jill herself is going to get to present it to Dana-Farber. So go donate and make sure that you're giving for cancer as well as for entertainment media. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Um.